when uh, when I'm gone out of the pulpit this summer, the um, elders in training and everybody else is pitching in. We kind of decided that we were going to do uh, summer in Philippians, and uh, so all of the crew had decided we broke that up into pieces, and so that there was some continuity through the summer. So I hope you've been enjoying that. We're going to continue to see some installments of that. But I continue in um, the study of Luke chapter, we're in chapter 17, and we've uh, roared right through it because we're only in sermon 210 at the moment in the Gospel of Matthew. Part of the thing is that there's, uh, some of these passages are so um, wonderful and we, and we need to explore the depth of them rather than roar over them quick and so we end up that we don't necessarily cover an awful lot of ground. But my, my goal is not to cover a lot of verses, my goal is to cover a lot of truth. And so we're going to try and do that. Luke chapter 17, two verses. But, and our two verses are verses 5 and 6, but to give you the context, we'll go back to verse 1. And he said to his disciples, It is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to whom, to him through whom they come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that, uh, than that he would cause one of these little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times a day and returns to you seven times saying, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And the Lord said, if you had the faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this passage. Help us, Lord, to lay aside our uh, predispositions and our preconceived notions. Help us to be taught by what is here the meaning of scripture, the voice of God is the word of God correctly understood and discerned as to what was in the mind of the author, both the, the human author and the very deity of God, their Holy Spirit, as he inscripturated your word and and, and picked out a particular group of things to say that were going to end up being sufficient, that would be uh, enable us to be fully fitted out unto all good works. So, Lord, we, we thank you for that. Help us, Lord, to come to a good understanding amidst, in, in a world where there's so many deceptions, where there are so many false ideas. Help us, Lord, to come to what you were intending to communicate very capably from your word. Help us, Lord, to see that in an undistracted and accurate way by your spirit. Enable me, I would pray, to be clear. Enable me to be helpful, I would pray. And, uh, Lord, that out the end of it, that we would come and we would be appropriately, properly glorifying you for what you have done and said in your word for we ask these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we turn again to the study of a fairly long body of teaching in the book of Luke. We see what well might be the start of this one long day of teaching. And the teaching day probably started back in uh, chapter 14. Verse 25, now large crowds were going along with him, and he turned to them and said to them, and it continues there. That was the, probably the beginning of that day at some point. And we see that the day continues. For example, chapter 15, verse 1, now all the tax collectors and the sinners 
were coming near to him to listen to him, and they began to grumble. And then there's a whole uh, group of teaching, uh, quite a lengthy teaching, that he is then begins in, and we're in the middle of that. So he's alternating between teaching his disciples and then turning and warning the scribes and Pharisees who are listening in. In the process, he teaches five parables where Jesus used a narrative to illustrate an important spiritual point. And I would hasten again to say, by calling them parables, we cannot at all say, therefore, every one of these stories has no basis at all in fact or in history, that these events never actually took place exactly as described. Quite the contrary, we know of many places where the text tells us that Jesus told a parable, parabole, to roll something alongside of for the purpose of illustration. He told a parable, but the event Jesus was describing was historically accurate. So we know in a great many cases for sure that it was a parable, but it actually happened. And We've talked about that a bit. During this teaching session, Jesus told a story about a prodigal son. A certain man had two sons. And he gave a very grave warning and description concerning Hades. Well, now in chapter 17, our Lord has once again turned to his teaching to the disciples. Specifically, as we can see in verse 5, not just the disciples, which was a rather large group, but the, the apostles in particular. Well, our passage today, in order to understand it better, it would be good to understand a bit of a context, be, bring us back to the same mindset as hearers. And about six months earlier, Jesus had assured them that offenses, and the word is scandalon, sin trap trigger sticks would come. And then he adds, but woe to the world through whom they came. And now Jesus adapts that earlier passage and that earlier message. He says, scandalon, sin bait, if you will, was inevitable, but woe to him through whom they come. And he says, you, you believers, be on your guard. The world is not the only possible source of sin bait. Believers through selfish, undisciplined, imprudent, reckless living can cause one of the Lord's micron, his little ones. If you were Scottish, you'd say his wee bairns, his little ones. Um, In fact, he uses a term very often when, for example, when he's calling to the disciples who are out on the fishing boat after his death, burial, and resurrection, he said, hey, you toddlers, it'd be the, and it was sort of an affectionate term that he used of them. But when he uses that term, the micron, the wee veterans, his much-loved toddlers, he says, don't cause them to stumble. Don't cause them to stumble. It would be preferable that your life ended from a human perspective early and calamitously than to be the cause of one of his little ones to stumble. Be on your guard. Watch yourself. Watch your words. Watch your actions. Watch your life. Paul very evidently understood how serious this issue was. He did a whole chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. He says, now concerning things offered to idol, meat offered to idol. Can you eat meat offered to idol? Oh, sure. Sure you can. Oh, but careful. Be on your guard. If you're eating meat causes a younger uh, brother, someone weaker, to stumble, don't do it. You go, well, under what circumstance? Well, let's say you and a younger, weaker brother are invited out to somebody's place. And so you're, at a, you're, you're being hosted. And the host says, here, let's have a beefsteak. You go, what are you going to do? Eat beefsteak. Eat beefsteak. However, if the lady at that point in time says, oh, by the way, this was meat that was offered to Zeus. Join us in the worship of Zeus. You go, boy, this is a tough situation. Are are you going to offend your hostess? Yeah? 
What, what would motivate you to offend your hostess? Well, the possibility that you would offend your weaker brother. You are, he's a brother. He'll get over it. No. You have a higher priority in watching out for the younger brother than accommodating the unbelief. The world needs to know, man, we're a family, and, and, and that's our first priority is taking care of family, and you don't cause a younger brother to stumble. And he says at the end of 1 Corinthians chapter 8, if eating meat or drinking wine is going to cause somebody to stumble, I won't eat it while the world stands. I'll, I'll quit forever. And you go, wow, that's a bit extreme. Next chapter, he says, do you know something? I'm in this fight. And, the, and this fight is a fight between uh, what am I going to do and what are my liberties and what's my ministry and how am I going to bear fruit? And he says, here's one thing I do. I fight to discipline my body. My body wants a whole bunch of things. He says, but I fight my body and I give myself a black eye. In other words, literally. He says, in order that I would not become a dakamos, is the Greek word, found dis, um, dishonorable and now no longer um, appropriate for me to be in ministry. I'm disapproved for service. Fight that that would not happen because you can be disapproved for service out of giving in to, ah, I got liberty. So, boy, Paul took this pretty careful. Be on your guard. Why did Paul take that so careful? Well, because he knew this principle. This principle that we see taught for us in Luke chapter 17, be on your guard. Don't cause other little ones to stumble. Well, then Jesus next revisited teaching from an earlier day again and warned and reminded them about interchurch, inter ecclesia behavior and responsibility. If you see your brother, a fellow family little one, sin, and we looked at that, this is a pattern of behavior. It says, go and rebuke him tentatively. Is it possible, could it be possible that on such and such a day, at such and such a time, you did this and this, which according to the word of God here, says it is sin. And then you find, oh, that wasn't you. You weren't there. No, that didn't happen. So rebuke tentatively, carefully. But, but jump in there and protect your family members from sin. Protect them from sin. Establish your facts, confront them with the word of God on the issue. If they repent of that sin, well, how do we know they repent? Well, it says, if they come to you and say, that is, they affirm it verbally, forgive them. Forgive them even if it is against you that they have sinned. And this is the seventh time today. Confront lovingly and carefully and humbly, forgive tirelessly, Watch yourselves, Jesus warns. Okay, that's the context. And here's the response, verse 5. The, impos the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. At this point, we see some rather rare humility on the part of the reaction of the disciples. Luke indicates that all of the disciples were in unison on this one. There's nothing that would indicate when they said, oh, increase our faith, nothing that would indicate that this was some sort of a subtle resistance or some sort of a muted protest, not at all. This is rather a frank assessment of their perceived abilities and a resultant realization that they were inadequate to the task. Oh, Lord, increase our faith. They saw the magnitude of this. Paul similarly asked the rhetorical question most of us have faced when we contemplate the seriousness of the Christian life and testimony. He talked about the idea that, that he is ongoing, continuously, a testimony uh, to the world. There's a, there's a savor of life to the, to the unsaved world. There's a savor of death. And, uh, and he says, we have this difficult life lived under the constant inspection of 
both believers and unbelievers, and he asks the rhetorical question, and who is sufficient? Who's adequate for all of these things? That's the same, that's the same sentiment. Well, Jesus responds, and again, the word increase means add to, not established for the first time, add to our faith. They're saying, I, I think I need a bigger pile of it. And here is the corrective provided by our Lord, verse 6. And the Lord said, if you had faith like a mustard seed, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. So, just so we understand the basics a bit better, we should do a bit of botany. What do you say? Let's look at some botany. First, the mustard seed. The mustard seed that was common to that area would have been approximately the size of a, size of a poppy seed. Quite a bit smaller. The ones that you have now are, are, have been generated over years and they would be considered massive compared to the early ones. Quite small, these, these ones were. In fact, it was the smallest seed of the, co the crops that they commonly grew. And when you mush it up, it became a brown paste. You say, well, that's not really mustard. Well, the mustard that you are familiar with is brownish too. But you're, the one that you're familiar with is a preparation that includes generous quantities of turmeric for the yellowing effect. You may not have known that. What you're taking on is mustard has many, many seasonings in it, one of which is turmeric, and that's why that's that beautiful yellow. There. Oh, by the way, where does mustard come from? Well, now, depending on who you're talking to, approximately three quarters of the world's supply of mustard comes from? That's right, Saskatchewan. There you have it. For the world. Interesting. The mulberry tree. The mulberry is a tree that grows about 40 feet tall and has berries that sort of look like blackberries, if you can picture that, and tastes slightly like them as well. Now this tree holds a few other distinctions. Here's the first distinction if you kind of Google this. The black mulberry has the distinction of being the world's fastest moving plant. Sila. It is the world's fastest moving plant. What do you mean by it? Not that it wanders up and down and around the fence line overnight, but the flower of this mulberry tree is spring-loaded so that at just the right moment, when the pollen is mature, when it's ready to go, and the time is perfect, it flings its pollen like a medieval catapult into the air at a speed clocked at half the speed of sound. Wow. If you're having a tough time picturing just how fast that is, you evidently have never been passed by a minivan of Baptists when they're in danger of being late for church. And Steve and Ty will thank me that I said minivan in case I just directed immediate attention and just said a van full of. So we didn't do that. So very, very, it, it has that distinction. But also it has one other thing, and that is the mulberry tree has a very extensive root system, similar but far more extensive than our willow tree. Have you ever latched onto one and tried to pull it out by the roots? Well, it would be easy compared to a, willow, to, to a mulberry. They're renowned for strangling and destroying drain systems and pipes. Even the neighbor's drain system and pipe way over there, it can strangle get inside of and destroy at great distances. It is renowned for destroying concrete sidewalks and walkways with their extremely aggressive, powerful, matted roots. As I was doing the reading on this, the rabbis of Jesus' era said that the roots of a mulberry tree could survive 600 years. 600 years of what? I don't know. Six, 600 years. The rabbis were never regarded as particularly remarkable botanists, and they were known to exaggerate, but nevertheless, the tree was renowned for its 
massive number of deep, tenacious root fibers in its immense crown of a root clump. That's what it was known for. And so, verse 6, he said, If you had the faith like a mustard seed, got a picture of that now, you would say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted. Oh, okay, so now we're getting how that is, uprooted. And be planted in the sea, which is the term usually used for the Mediterranean. And it would obey you. What in the world does Jesus mean? Better, don't respond to it emotively and I don't, what does it mean to me? It's irrelevant. The question is, what was the meaning that would have been the immediate apparent meaning to his first century audience? That's what you're going for, okay? Jesus used a similar expression earlier, as we read in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. Let's review that again. Matthew chapter 17. Very similar sort of a expression. The context of this is they're coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And as they do, they, they come across a particularly difficult case of demonization of a child. And, uh, but it says, and Jesus rebuked him, verse 18, and the demon came out of him and the boy was cured at once. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not drive it out? What's wrong, like, what's wrong with us? And he said to them, because of the littleness of your faith, for truly I say to you, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, okay, same comparison, you would say to this mountain, move over here to there, and it would move, and nothing will be impossible to you. Uh, scoot ahead to chapter 21. Chapter 21, verse 21. The context of this is he cursed a fig tree, and it just kind of crizzled up. And they're going, wow, how did that happen? Verse 20, seeing this, the disciples were amazed and asked, how did that fig tree wither all at once? Man, after three years, you'd think, oh, we're walking day by day with the incarnate Son of God. We should kind of see this coming, but they still weren't getting it. Jesus answered and said to them, truly I say to you, if you have faith to do I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to this fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Wow. Um, first of all, in these two passages in Matthew, why talk about a mountain? Well, there's the demonstrative pronoun, this. Say to the, they're standing on a mountain. He's just picking something that is big and impossible and it's immediately present and it's demonstrative, this mountain. You can say to this mountain. They're looking at it. The one they're standing on now, okay? But he says, nothing is impossible to you. Wow. What are we going to do with that? That's what Jesus says. So Jesus repeats this similar, simile in verse 20, 21, and he says, and here's the point, do it with no doubting. Mountain cast into the sea. Again, that's a term the user refers to the Mediterranean. In Matthew, Jesus talks about this mountain. Here in Luke, he's saying this mulberry tree. So now we get the idea. It is what is immediately you can lay your hands on as an illustration when he says, you can say to this mulberry, obviously they're doing this right by the mulberry tree right there. So they're standing in beside or in view of a mulberry tree. What in the world is Jesus communicating on multiple occasions? Well, the number of suggestions here are deafening. And here's the problem. I feel I have a need to do some deconstructing because this passage is so frequently visited and tortured to death and, and forced to say some things that the scripture would never say. So I have to do some deconstructing before we say, and this is what it does say. 
So, what is he communicating? Some have suggested Jesus is being insulting. He's being insulting. If you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, if you had the brain the size of a green beetle, if your arms were as strong as a sparrow's knee, um, but as we go forward, we see that Jesus is teaching. He's not mocking them. That's not the point of this. Okay. Next suggestion. And this is a big one. And this is what you will hear most commonly. Okay. Everybody, go ahead and show your mettle. Prove your spiritual power by flinging big rooty trees into the ocean or throwing great mountains crashing into the ocean. Everybody, on the count of three, go! That, that's what the passage says. And there are word of faith types out there who believe or say they believe this is precisely what we're being encouraged to do. Well, you are being encouraged to do, generally, not them. But you're being encouraged to do this. And you are sort of shamed for not trying and accomplishing such carnival feats. Why aren't you doing this? What should you say to someone who's claiming that Jesus wants us to win our spurs by doing the tree fling or the mountain hurl? How are we supposed to respond to that? Here's a great response. Wonderful. You first. You first. And you'll usually notice that while they're trying to encourage you to do it, it's weird. There's just not many mountains that they have flung, you know, this last week into the ocean. Not many of them have not just, you know, pulled them up, but that would be tried a feat of strength, but they haven't just sort of, by command, you, they, you, you won't see that there's a whole bunch of mulberry trees out floating in the Mediterranean. So... What should you say? Well, you be first. You know, I would suggest that you be kind as you're doing this. Let them start out with a hill of potatoes. Just, just command the potato plant on the count of three. What they will typically say at that point, and I've done this, what they'll typically say at this point is, oh, I would do that, but uh, you don't believe and so I can't. Whoa, 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 whoa. That's not what the passage talks about. Jesus says, if you believe. So, buddy. I mean, if they, they're saying that you should be doing this in the presence of unbelievers as a, an evangelistic tool. Okay, so it's going to be done in the presence of unbelievers. I would admit that I'm certainly agnostic at this point in time that you can uproot this great big spruce tree and plant it in the middle of uh, Sandy Beach. But I'm, I'm willing to watch. Go for it. And the whole point is, Jesus said, if you believe. Usually they say, if you believe, would, uh, this is always done in the presence of unbelievers, but it's also usually done with, first of all, you have to give them some seed money. You have to give them some money uh, first to demonstrate, you know, and, and so it, it is, there's a, there's a monetary thing here. But. The, the point is, is Jesus advocating his followers undertake geological map-altering pronouncements? Is this supposed to be an evangelistic mainstay? Is that what the passage is teaching? One novel website I found insists that the mustard seed itself has great faith. In fact, to get it right from the, pa the passage here, if you had faith like a mustard seed, see? Mustard seeds are incredibly good believers. So the translation that they mangle says, you have to have the faith of that mustard seed. My, are mustard plants ever mindful, thoughtful, loyal, trusting, powerful believers. Plants, as we all know, are kind of just like that. Just talk to them and cure for yourself. And most people, when you kind of follow that through, they go, oh dear, that, that, that's not it. Well, 
Now a couple of very common advanced takeaway examples. The two examples I'm going to use today, one I read and one I heard personally. And I'm doing this again to do the deconstructing to clear the way so that we don't syncretize and put it together and say somehow it meshes together. I want us to really just understand the passage. Here's the first one online. I'm tired and ashamed of pattern baldness, the chap writes. What they should do is just kind of shave it off and it'll look cool. But anyway, he says, I'm tired and ashamed of pattern baldness. And he writes, I'm believing God for the return and restoration of my hair. The issue might be a little different, but the sentiment you've heard before. I'm believing God for fill in the blank. In this case, he's believing God for the restoration and return of his hair. Not, I believe that God could restore my hair. I would suggest everyone who believes in the God of the Bible would believe that, right? We all believe he could. He's saying something different. I'm believing God for the returning and restoration of my hair. Well, at this point, it could mean a number of things. Thing number one. Listen carefully. If I believe hard enough, God has to do it. Have you heard that? In fact, it goes on. I have faith in my faith. I believe in my belief. And further to that, my words are as powerful as the words of Jesus. So if I speak the words, it's got to happen. That's what he could mean. Number two, I have faith in my faith. I believe my hair has been restored, but you need the eyes of faith to see it. So I visualize it as I sit there, and I comb it in the fresh air. And very soon everyone will be able to see it. And you go, no, there, yeah, no, there, there are people who believe that. And I am believing God that he has already made me a millionaire. I keep on opening my, my CIBC account and it says, oh, horrible things, but I'm just believing. And I'm confessing. And, and it is there. We're just waiting for the bank manager to go, hey, look at that. Just hasn't happened yet. Number three, what he could mean is the word of faith guy said that God would do it or had done it, and that as long as I don't start doubting it, I will very soon look like Absalom. But if I ever doubt, I'll lose my miracle. Do you know something? Those are, taken those three, the most common place that this verse is taken to. And you go, seriously? Yeah, seriously. Well, let's look at them one at a time, shall we? Number one. Number one, which is, I believe that because I have been, uh, that I am a son of God, now I have the power to command, now I have the power to speak, and that it has to come into existence, and, and like that. May I just cut to the chase on this? That is called pseudo-Christian shamanism. It's a form of witchcraft. In witchcraft, what you're trying to do is come up with words and phrases that obligate the gods to do what I want. With this form of, that is, comes within the Christian church, it is that you learn to do certain things, say certain things with a certain thing in your heart, and you make God do your will. Which again is just the essence of shamanism. If this is an accurate take 
on your prayer and faith and God and how you relate to him and you're operating under those ideas I say with love in my heart you are under demonic deception and you very well may need to come to a saving knowledge a saving relationship to God because the God of the Bible is not a bellhop placed in the universe for you to command to your benefit the God of the Bible for a disciple is the one that we joyfully embrace as our master he tells us what to do and we wouldn't have it any other way that's a disciple that's why when he talks about one of the the properties of us being our, our relationship with him he uses terms like slave master Lord um, he does not talk about God being servant bell hop and quick hop at it Jeeves it's not that word of faith advocates and teachers assure you that the way to get God to do what you command him to do is mental exercises where you have faith in your faith and they'll teach you to say that in the morning faith in my faith believe in your belief if you believe hard enough you can create and destroy worlds just like God they teach you can go into clips and find that they say one of the things that's required is that you need to believe you are a God folks this is and I have no reservations about saying it this is a satanic cult and a satanic deception you are never to be the source of your own faith it's never self-generated if it's authentic saving faith or authentic sanctifying faith you are never to be the object of your own faith God is always to be the object of your faith you are to believe God and the sure and sufficient source of what he wishes you to believe is in his word recorded for everyone to study and reason through together most importantly you are to believe what God has said in his word he is the only sovereign and potentate not us what a wonder what a goodness that he doesn't share those incommunicable characteristics with us who are fallen that that's so wise that's so good Do you believe that if you believe hard enough you could turn someone into a blue bottle fly I've asked that question to people in this group and they'll say well no well yeah because their theology is kind of leading them well it doesn't sound rational but yeah no probably could if I believed hard enough second question would you like that kind of power that you if you wanted to you could turn somebody into a blue bottle fly do you want the power to lift up the space fighter jet like Yoda or lift a mountain covered with people as some sort of a personal power show that's the heart of shamanism witchcraft disguised in Christian lingo stolen from mangled Bible verses isolated from their context and crafted by Satan if you're believing those kind of things about yourself and your words with much humility but with love in my heart I would plead with you repent of the blasphemy that you have the power and self-determination of God repent of believing that words spoken by you ever have the same power as words spoken by God or were ever intended to be it's blasphemy first of all and then it's sheer madness 
I mean, it is sheer madness. Plead that God would deliver you from this. Okay, number two. I, I, in my faith, I believe my hair has been restored, but you need the eyes of faith to see it. So I visualize it, I comb it, and soon everybody will see it. This is lifted right from the pages of an unsaved cult. The movement is called Christian Science, and it was founded by Mary Baker Eddy. It has an inadequate understanding of God. It is non-Trinitarian. It has an inadequate standing of the sacrifice of Christ, completely unbiblical. It has a completely unbiblical understanding of how you get saved. The movement is called Christian Science, but it's a little bit like grape nuts. It ain't Christian and it ain't science. It's not a church of believers or for believers. It is occultic and it's sheer madness. Number three, the word of faith guy said that God would do it or had done it and that as long as I don't start doubting it, I will very soon look like Absalom. And if I ever doubt, I'll lose my miracle. Usually, this now very familiar scam is preceded with the requirement to give the faith, uh, the guy faith seed money as they prey on people who are gullible and desperate. You need to fork over cash so you can get your miracle. And inevitably, the result is shame and self-loathing when the miracle that has been paid for with hard currency never materializes because the blame is always immediately placed on the victim. That's the game, and it's been played a long time. And people are still going there because they're assured, because they're deceived, and because they're desperate. Well, what does this verse mean then? It might sound like what you know, Howard has done here is he took a, a really nice verse and then pulled all its teeth out and chopped it off at the knees and and then cut in half and you know now we're dicing this thing up. What does it mean? Or better, what was the meaning that would have been immediately apparent to his first century audience? Jesus is telling the disciples that they will be able to do things that are impossibly difficult uprooting mulberry trees, uprooting mountains, if they had a very little of the right kind of faith. The right kind of faith has the right object. The object of your faith is always supposed to be not your faith, not your power, not your tingly. It is always supposed to be God. Faith in God. God is revealed in his word. Okay, let's, let's take a passage that really tackles this head on. Turn, if you would, to 1 John chapter 5, please. First John chapter 5. Well, it sounds like very much the same thing in verse 15. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, what is the condition? If we know he hears us in whatever we ask. Wow. That sort of sounds like a blank page, right? We know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Man, that sounds confident. That sounds like faith. That's, it sounds kind of like the, the no doubting thing, right? Let that sink in your head. If we know that he hears us in whatever we ask Selah we know that we have, the, we have the requests which we have asked from him okay Mr. Preacher Man explain that verse wow the right kind of faith. We, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. That sounds like tree flinging again. And I mean, this is written by John. John was on the mountain when Jesus talked about moving the mountain. 
He saw the withered fig, fig tree and heard the explanation about throwing a mountain into the sea. He was right there when Jesus taught what was recorded in Luke chapter 17. He, he, saw, the, he saw the mulberry tree. He was there. Okay, I got a question. When you pray and ask for whatever, do you know that Jesus hears you? Do you know that Jesus hears you? And if we just asked there and we just looked at that verse in isolation, we go, well, I guess we'd have to say yes. Like, are, are there some things where God doesn't hear us? Is there something inadequate about his auditory ability? Is there something where all of a sudden I would be praying and Jesus saying, hey, can you turn that up a bit? I'm, I'm getting a lot of interference here. Does Jesus hear you? Well, sure, he hears, right? I mean, are there some special conditions for God hearing us and therefore getting whatever we ask for? Isn't it just a case of just believe hard enough? You think, boy, we better get to this by the time we're done, or I don't know what we're going to do. Oh, I know. Let's read the verse before. That'll work. This is the confidence we, which we have before him. Okay, so here is the basis of the confidence that we have literally in the face of right here living before God. Here it is. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What? First class condition. He will hear us if what? You believe hard enough. You chant it. You visualize it. You take a picture, put it on your refrigerator. No. If what? If we ask anything according to his will. Oh. Ask anything. But you say, but other places Jesus said, I just have to ask in his name. Right? Same thing. Same thing. Ask in his name. What does he mean? Asking for something in the name of Jesus is like exercising righteous power of attorney. That's what the phrase means. You are to be conducting business in his name as his proxy. People would, would commit over and they'd give power of attorney to somebody to do business in their name. And that was never a time where they go, oh cool, I would like a jet boat. And I would like a pony. I'd like a fire engine. No, you're, you're, that's his stuff, his money, and you're supposed to be conducting his business for his benefit, and anything else is called crooked. You can do time for that, right? So you conduct business for him on his account, doing the things that he has clearly revealed as his will. That's doing business in his name. Ask for anything according to his will. It's consistent, right? You and we are to be doing exactly what Jesus wants and as instructed in his very adequate word and to his benefit. We are asking for something we know is within his so the sovereign will of God. How can I tell if what I think is faith is just really well-meaning but ignorant presumption. How do I know? Well, let's employ this principle on my second case. First case, I'm believing God for more hair. This one is closer. It's all too real. I'm just going to pick one case because I've had this happen a few times. But a, a chap was talking to me and in the conversation said, I'm believing God for the salvation of my wife. I'm believing God for the salvation of my wife. Now what are you going to do with that? As I questioned further, it became clear that he was not saying he believed God could save his wife. Anybody here believe that God could not? No, we all believe God could save his wife. That's not what he was saying. He was working hard, digging down deep, and willing with all his might to believe that God would save 
his wife. So here's how we proceed. Did God promise a believer in his word that he would certainly save their spouse? Did he? Is there something in the word of God that I can dig down deep on and be absolutely convinced that God is going to do this? Well, matter of fact, just quick for a moment, keep your finger in 1 John chapter 5, but let's scoot back to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. As he's talking about this difficult situation of a mixed marriage, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 15, <clears throat> oh, I'm on the wrong page, here we go. He says, yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. I thought he was supposed to pray and believe and that God was going to save his wife. Well, matter of fact, it says, for how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? And it's a rhetorical question with the assumed answer, you don't. You don't. So, the issue was for that gentleman, he'd been taught, he'd been taught a theology, but his faith was rooted in a fond wish. It was not rooted in a verse. So in your prayer, the thing you're trying hard to believe, is it rooted in a fond wish or is it rooted in a verse? That's a good clearinghouse question to ask. But having done all that, you could go, boy, it sounds like, I don't, I don't know if this verse means anything. Listen to the verse again. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that he will, we will have the requests which we have asked from him. That's a big promise. Now scoot away all the nonsense that's kind of floated along with it. Scoot that away, but don't miss the enormity of what he's just said. If you ask for something that is within the will of God, you'll get it even if to mankind it's impossible. Your heart should be leaping and skipping down the trail like a calf let out in the spring at that point, right? Whatever we ask, we have. But employ this only while righteously acting solely on the benefit of Jesus, acting on what we know he has told us in his word. I'm going to give an illustration. I hope it's helpful. It's going to be lesser than the illustrations here. But back in the day when I was a younger man, I, did, I had that phase where I was doing oil field work and I was doing a lot of dirt work. And I had the, the opportunity to deal with some really big pieces of iron. D9 cats, you know, they could tip over skyscrapers. And on one occasion, I remember I was in a monster, a double elephant of a loader. And it struck me that as I was running this thing, under my foot, I had more horses than I'd ever seen in, in one, one buggy in my life. Wow, this thing had power. I just pulled back on this little lever, huge rocks go, pull back on this le little lever, and I can lift up one of those articulating in the center dump trucks. Wow, this thing has got power. Incredible. Uh, the, the, it could do things that are absolutely impossible to me. I could go into a line of gravel, dig in, go whoop, 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 and the whole thing squats down, and, I'm, and I can fill a truck with it. It was, that thing was a monster. And the point was, 
Did I need to have the strength of 10 elephants to run it? No. No. I didn't need any special power or strength. A 90-pound teenager could run this massive thing. They could reach the pedals and reach the levers. Didn't take any particular prowess. It just needed to be able to do the right things with this massive, powerful thing. And wonderfully, the designer of this thing, Caterpillar, had thought, you know something out there? There be cowboys. There's a few guys out there that are cowboys at heart. And they feel all that power under their foot and they go, I can do anything. And so they say, I'm going to feel the power. I'm going to run straight up on top of this gravel. No, you're not. No. Because it won't let you do that. I'm going to take this thing and I'm going to get her wound up to 50 miles an hour down the road and see if I can do a four-wheel drift. No, you're not going to do that. Because they've already thought of that. There's cowboys out there who are not going to do the right things with that power. That was thoughtful. That was smart. That was, that was imperative. I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to fill that bucket up with a bunch of gravel and I'm going to show you how powerful this is. I'm just going to go rodden right out onto this great big old piece of muskeg. No, you're not. <laughs> you're not going there. You say, well, then it's not much of a machine. Yeah, it is. But wonderfully, it was designed within some parameters. You don't have to be this monster of a guy to run it. You just have to run it the way it's meant to be run. And, and it's meant to be run within some boundaries that are wisely and prudently provided. That's what asking stuff in faith is. It's within the will of God. Because one of you out there, old gay, I, I, I just, I have to have it. It is going to be a warm day. In fact, it would be really good if it was 35 above today. And someone over here says, one thing I'm not going to have is 35 above. I need it to be about 17 degrees and to be raining. And then you have what? Chaos. So you're not granted that kind of power. Who has that power? Oh, yeah. God. Good thing. But if you ask something in his will... You can get stuff done that is impossible. Folks were called to an impossible task of turning the hearts of men and women to the Lord. Impossible to dead, deaf, unbelievers. But impossible things are possible. But not because of how hard you wish or how hard you presume. The power is not in you or me. It is never a situation where the power is you or me. You or I decreeing this or that or declaring this or that is meaningless. That's blasphemous as well. The power is immensely powerful because it is from a powerful and wise God doing as he decrees and commands. I'm going to jar some of your mother's preserves. I actually don't believe, as the world would describe it, I don't believe in the power of prayer. You go, I thought so. I believe in the power of God, therefore I pray. There's a difference. I don't think that my prayers are some sort of a magic thing that's creating some new reality. I believe in the power of God, and so therefore I pray. That's prayer according to the Bible. All that's required is small but genuine faith in a God who is the Almighty. Now to finish. The faith that powerfully works is the same 
faith that powerfully saves. Remember the faith that saves? Four components. The faith that saves has the right content. You believe the right things about God. If you're believing the wrong things about God, you don't have the faith that saves. And, and you won't be proceeding in the power of God and in the, in the power that works. It has to have the right content. You need to be appropriately apprised of how things work. It has the right object. My faith always has to be in God and what he said he's going to do, not in what I presume or what I proclaim or whatever. The faith that saves and the faith that powerfully works has the right source. I don't get it out of my imagination or what I dream up. I get it from the Word of God. That's what I know is the Word of God. I know that that's the will of God. Go there. And the faith that powerfully works is the one that yields the right response, and that is, I acknowledge, I work on the very basis, on the continuing assumption, Jesus is Lord. I'm here to serve my Lord and Master, not make God do what I want. He's the Lord and Master. I don't try and master Him. Trying to master Him and get Him to do what I want is called shamanism. It's the occult. Me having it where I submit and yield to what God wants and do that joyfully, that's Christianity. See the difference? Um, and so as we close, do you see the difference? Do you have the faith that saves? Is the content of your faith biblical? Is the content of your faith, or is the object of your faith, what are you trusting in? Are you trusting, oh, the prayer I prayed, the going forward I did, the religious thing or that thing I did? Is that the object of your faith? Or is the object of your faith God? What is the source of your faith? Is it self-generated or is it something that God generates through his word? And the outcome of it, did you end up embracing Jesus as your master? I'll leave you with that. But I'd also encourage you, don't leave here without that issue settled once for all in your heart and life. Don't walk out of here being under the wrath of God. Don't do that. I'll call on the song leaders to come at the conclusion of my prayer tonight, this evening, or this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for this wonderful promise from your word. Thank you, Lord, that we are called to do impossible things, and when we do them in your name, and if we ask for them in your name, you will do them, because you are a powerful God. We thank you, Lord, for the fact that you distinguish yourself by doing that which is impossible to man. And, and we worship you for that. Help us, Lord, to walk this week in the light of that, using this powerful, powerful vehicle in a way that is pleasing and glorifying to you. For your glory and our joy, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Music team.